Hello, Tom Lavecchia here with a very special guest. You're watching a uh, new theory podcast in collaboration with Mobsters Inc. Hello, Tom Lavecchia here with a very special edition of Mobsters Inc. in collaboration with New Theory. This is my ninth, ninth. Uh, interview with an inducted member of Cosa Nostra. Without further ado, Dom Sicali, former Bonanno captain. Dom Sicali, welcome to Mobsters Inc. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you, Tom? I'm well. I'm well. And it's interesting because Dominic, Dominic and I were supposed to hook up probably about December. It didn't happen. It would have been one of his first interviews. But I'm actually glad that he kind of has his show and has some stuff because my interview then – Verse now is going to be much different. So let's jump right in. So Dominic, I'm always interested in talking to made guys, uh, uh, you know, that I interview or have interviewed that generally I, I, I boil it down to, you know, having the father in the home or not having the father in the home. Give us kind of your background growing up and what type of male influence did you have? Uh, I had zero male influence. My okay. grandfather, I grew up with my grandparents and my mother. Okay. Uh, my grandfather was a hardworking man. He was just uh, very caring, very never went out, always home. Yeah. Um, where I needed somebody more aggressive, more, um, I would say, commanding somebody, you know, more not a knock around, but yeah. more of a father figure, the strength of a male. That's what I needed. And I never had that. That's why I gravitated to the streets. Now, you grew up in the Bronx, correct? Yes, sir. That is correct. What section? Pelham Bay section of the Bronx. So a lot of people don't know this and they really should um, as, and into my opinion, there's three major parts, Pelham Bay, somewhat Tremont section, and then obviously Morris Park, which have, have been and always stayed Italian strongholds versus respectfully Bensonhurst went very Asian. Um, a lot of in neighborhoods in Queens, maybe the exception of Whitestone. Uh, Astoria is now non-Italian. Um, we can go on and on and on. Everybody kind of migrated to Staten Island, New Jersey, but Bronx stayed strong and stayed very Italian. So the kids that you grew up with were these other Italian kids where they uh, knock around uh, uh, kids and knock around guys, were they civilians, were they mixed? Give us kind of your, 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 your okay. 11th grade crew, if you will. I grew up in the building we lived in was Hazel Towers. It was a 19 yeah. story building in yeah. the Pelham Bay section of the Bronx. Yeah. And any given time during the summer, there might have been about 30, 40 of us age. And I was one of the younger ones. Yeah. The safe, the age range from 10 to maybe 16 years old. Yeah. Um, and I would say I have everybody. Maybe 2% went bad. Interesting. You know, gravitated to the streets. Everybody else were, you know, just. So it was a middle class neighborhood, good neighborhood, solid. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, good, really great upbringing, obviously, uh, to have that type of ratio in an Italian neighborhood. Italian neighborhood, yeah. Well, because that's what's interesting is because people watch this, and, and interesting enough is probably only about 10% of my audience is uh, on the East Coast. It's actually London is number two, and I think um, New York is number one, London is number two, and then uh, I think Chicago is number three, and then throughout the, I have all different cities throughout the world. And what people really need to understand a very small portion actually goes into the life. I think the numbers go into one in like 10,000 Italians come doctors, come lawyers, that kind of stuff. Right. But with your father, as I understand, he was a street guy, but he wasn't a mob guy, correct? Correct. My father was a street guy, but growing up, he was away. He was doing a nine, he did nine and a half years back in the 70s, which oh, wow, okay. back then was unheard of. Yeah. When he did come home, um, he married, he was with another woman, so he wasn't living in our household. Yeah. And there was a lot of tension between him and I, conflict as we got to know one another. Yeah. And I just felt he never cared for me. He was caring for more for his stepkids than his uh, real son. Is he still alive, if I may ask? No, he passed away in sometime in 2011 while I was in the witness, while I was in federal custody, they housed me in the witness protection program. But I got a chance to speak to him. You did get it. You did get a chance. Yes. They allowed me to speak to him. And, you know, my first words were, I'm sorry. He said, don't be sorry for anything. I know what they did to you. I said, but dad, that's still no excuse. He still said, I love you. And you shouldn't be sorry. And there's a lot of people out there. He was talking about the made guys in the Bronx. Yeah. 
They're very upset with what happened to you, and they don't blame you. Was there a part of you, though, that and, – and don't get me wrong. I would not want to tussle with any of the Queens guys, the Brooklyn guys in any way. But the Bronx is a particularly kind of tough. Were you concerned for his safety when you rolled? Um, you know what? It's funny that you say that. He was in – actually, when I flipped, maybe I think a week later, the government never even told me. They arrested my father. So he was dealing drugs, and I didn't, had no clue. Yeah. They brought my father to MCC New York, which is a holding facility, federal holding yeah. facility. Vinny Basciano was in MCC at that time as well. And through the grapevine, Vinny sent word in the building, nobody better put their hands on my father. Oh, wow. That's the type of guy Vinny was. Like, he knew it wasn't my father's fault. I cooperated. Yeah. Until this day, I still say it. I love Vinny. I have a lot of love for him because we were with each other all the time. And for me not to say I love him, I care for him. But at the end of the day, to me, it was a business decision. It wasn't not, you know, I would never, I wouldn't take it back uh, because I'm happy where I am now today in my life. But yeah. um, I, it took me a lot of years to deal with my inner being on me cooperating, me breaking that code. Yeah. Um, we're going to get to the, the Vinny stuff. Like and say, we'll kind of stick to, you know, people that are super public or past, sure. well, obviously you, you, we both, you know, know we're not going to talk about current people, but I do want to, I do want to, I do have an interesting question in regards to your father. When you, the first thing you said was, I'm sorry. And this was a guy that, you know, you particularly weren't, you know, fond of in a sense where, um, he wasn't around probably some angst, but he's still your father. Correct. You know I, mean? so I think I find it powerful Correct. that you were worried about what he thought. Can you unpack that a little more? Because I felt that was yeah. pretty powerful. To me, my father was just a sperm donor. Uh, okay. I always felt he didn't love me. He didn't care for me. And again, that's what led me to the streets. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, deep down, it's still my, I know it's my father. There's still that love, a child. Even my wife tells me today, I still see the pain when you talk about your father. And I'm 56 years old and I still feel it. So I can imagine the younger kids growing up. It's just, and he wasn't even in my life. It's just, it's that impactful for a person, a human being to, um, you know, be craving something, watching his, my other friends having their fathers at their baseball games, teaching them how to throw a baseball, how to throw a football, yep. and me not having a father there doing that. And, yeah. you know, it hurt. It hurt growing up. But, you know, you turn to you tend to get numb. And that's what pushed me to the streets. I never had his support. That's a that's a great point. I, I, I um, equate back to and although we're an Italian American community and generally Italian American fa fathership is strong um, when it's not strong. Fatherless absence plays a big deal. And most of the guys I talk to were ha are in the same boat. I was in the same boat as well. My father left when I was two. I'm a self-made guy, not me in that life, but right, made, right. Uh, 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 in, in, in career and stuff and financial. And I think I had to prove to myself that I didn't need him. And I also didn't want anything from my mother. So I was very like, you know what? I'm going to make my own stuff. I don't want stuff from you. Even though she gave it, I didn't want it because I felt bad taking anything from her because he left her. So we're not going to do it. We're not going to go to Dr. Phil today, but it's just to, to set up the context. And so, you know okay. something, Tom, if I may, the funny yeah, part, nobody knows this. Okay. Ooh, exclusive. The, the, you have the exclusive with this one. It's funny that you say that because when I was maybe about 10 years old, my Aunt Barbara, who's my mother's sister, she has three boys. They lived in Rockland County in Pearl River. She yeah. told my mother she wanted to take me. I oh. want to take Dominic, have him come live with us. Yeah. We'll give him the structure he needs. Because they saw I was very athletic. I was into yeah. sports. Yeah. But they also saw I was veering the wrong way as far as scholastics in school. Yeah. And she offered, she says, let me take him. Let him come live with us. You know, you're always welcome to see him. It's your son, but this is yeah. my nephew. And, you know, my mother, I don't blame her. She yeah. said, no, that's my son. I'm keeping him. I'm all she had at that time. So but yeah. my life would have been different, definitely, if my mother would have agreed. Wow. Yeah, that's profound. Those those that that's why I try to do these interviews because people watching always have like those forks in the road and that this and the wide forks and those decisions that you might have made three or like like the reason why I, I love talking to guys like you and I'm not a street guy, never was, 
but we're both Italian Americans, grew up in the area, grew up in the culture, and we're only three or four decisions away of of being close or far from each other. You know Correct. what I mean? Like, yes. So, so if I was, you know, maybe grew up in the Bronx or you grew up in suburban New Jersey, things might have been different. Um, all right. So, so what was what was high school Dominic like? Were you, you know, the the, the football guy? You know, what, give us high school Dominic. Uh, high school Dominic. I started in my freshman year, Monsignor Scanlon, which is a Catholic okay. high school. Okay. I was very much into basketball. I was nice. started on the uh, JV. I was one of the starters. And what the coaches did, there was a kid, a guy, kid at that time, Chris Jennings. We both went from St. Benedict's to Monsignor Scanlon. They actually elevated him to the JV, so I had somebody that I was familiar with. Yeah. Um, I was excelling. I had college um, uh, recruits looking at me. Um, oh, wow. And then um, what happened was that year I failed science by one point. The teacher, I did not want to go to summer school. And that's one of the first times my father interjected to my mother, let him go to public school, let him go. And my mother didn't want me to go to public school. Oh, wow. And then going into the 10th grade, I got what I wanted because my father had my backing. And that was it. I, that whole, the 10th grade, I never even went. I was wow. hanging out with everybody else. So you, you didn't finish high school? No. No, I did okay. not. Okay. Um, well, uh, listening to you and talking to you, you know, I would have, and uh, you know, this form of education doesn't really matter, but and doesn't make you educated. But I could tell you're an educated individual, definitely at the bare minimum in, in the school of life. So you Thanks. hit the streets kind of early, you know, tenth grade, you kind of hanging around with, with people. When did you start? You know, set us up. What? What? When did you first kind of get into the life? Let's do street life before mafia. And what was a mafia like back then? Uh, I really wasn't around the mafia back then. Um, well, I was, and I didn't even know it, put it yeah, that yeah. way. Um, yeah. I was selling drugs, making money, selling fireworks, just a street hustle, whatever yeah. was there. And then I had, um, a guy who's around the West side, the Genovese crime family, Ernie yeah. Muscarello. He, um, Basically took a liking to me. I was always around him, teaching me things. And me not even realizing I was being groomed. Uh, teach me how to fight uh, and a lot of other things in the street. How to, you know, if I'm sitting in a place, always sit towards the door, face the door. And he gave me a lot of difference. He was schooling me, grooming me. Yeah. And I really didn't know it at that time. Yeah, it's so like conflicting as an adult, right? You're like on one end, that was kind of like probably a mentor, and, and this is gonna sound terrible, but if you're gonna be in the life, might as well be in the mafia. You know what I mean? Like it's like right, right, right. You know what I mean? It's like the Harvard of the life. There's some structure. There's some honor. There's some rules for us being in a gang or maybe some loose knit thing. So on one end, you can kind of look at it in a form of mentorship, a a a, a, ba a, a good guy in a bad situation. But on the other end, now that we're a little more educated and we're older now, and we have our own kids and our lives, we're kind of saying, hey, you know what? That's grooming. And I think you're right on that. Um, what what did you learn from him? If you could take away one thing from him that holds true today, that's a positive thing you learned, what would that be? Oh. <laughs> well, I broke the code. I ratted. So, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, just so if you're right, go all out. Never back yeah. down. Um, yeah. And he would always tell me that too. You have yeah. any problems in this neighborhood, you do what you have to do. And anybody comes up to you, anyone, you you come to me. Immediately come to me and I'll handle it. So he gave me a green light. And there's things I did, a lot of things I did as a kid, bad. Yeah. And where people, adults came in. People, I guess they were mobbed up. Yeah. And they came up to try to chastise me and he grabbed them. This kid does whatever he wants in this neighborhood. This is his neighborhood. And he always had my back. So that's where my father figure came from, him. Yeah. My, my old show, um, I did it with John Panisi, who is a former Made member as well. And we discussed with him that he was much closer with the Gambinos and the Lucchese's. And he even said that he think his outcome would have been much different. Not that, you know, again, you want to be out of the life. Right. Just right. going back. Um, do you think your experience would have been much different if you just stayed with the West Side? Uh, absolutely. In the sense, 
Listen, and I always say this till this day, loyalty is a two-way street. True. Okay. Even though at the end of the day, I was jailed for acts I did on behest of the Bonanno crime family. Yeah. Vinny Bastiano is talking to Joe Messino, who's wearing a wire, talking about me killing somebody. That's a no-no. That never happens. Yeah. You're not supposed to talk about it. Once somebody's dead, that's it. Never gets mentioned again. Yeah. And if it does, it's a whisper in the ear uh, or you lip it. But that didn't happen. He's talking out loud. Then yeah. after I get locked up, Michael knows who's now the boss of the Bonanno crime family. He was the acting boss. Sends a message in. Tell Dominic he has nothing coming. Really? And the guy who he said it to told him, really? Dominic has nothing coming? Yeah. Okay, you sure you want me to send him that message? He said, send him that message. And then yeah. they took everything from me. They were stripping me of everything, finances, guys. So finally at the end, uh, and I said this prior, that the Christmas before I got locked up, I collected about 360000 Yeah. The Christmas I'm jailed, they had the audacity to send me $3,500 from my guys. The, I had so many people around me. but yeah. And that was just a straw that broke the camel's back. I said, I'm done. I'm done. Well, this, uh, you know, If you're not going to show me loyalty and some type of respect, yeah, for all the stuff I did and me holding it down, I'm done. I don't need this life anymore. So I... I tend to deep dive in this kind of stuff, right? And and hearing it directly from you, I do want to give a little bit of a little pushback and a little little sure. uh, thought on this. Um, when you did some off book stuff with, I guess with we don't even say who you did some off book right. stuff that never should have been brought up. Um, didn't you first break the rule by going off book? Absolutely, but in all retrospect, he was my superior. Yeah, who I did it with. And his excuse to Joe Messino on the first one was the fact the guy was trying to kidnap my son. And I had to act. I couldn't wait because, God forbid, I go to tell you, Joe, that yeah. was his, the way. He, and he was right in that sense. Yeah. You got it. So okay. Joe agreed to that. And then the okay. second one, it came from the boss. It came from himself. He was the acting boss. He had the power to call a shot if somebody was it. to get clipped. And so, so from here, so... So, and I get it. And, and this is what people got to understand too. There may be cause and extra rules and all this other stuff, but like you kind of work for your boss and that's your cause and extra. Like that's what Patrick Beck, David always try to say to Michael and Sammy that, um, that did you leave your boss or did you leave cause and extra? And they didn't like kind of really get like Sammy wasn't really getting it. It's Michael did. And Michael's so right. Um, where I think in your case, I think you more left your boss and cause and extra. Would you agree with that statement? Uh, correct. Yeah, I would say yes. And, you know, and another thing which was disgusting, Joe Messino, he played that card really well. He was the, you know what, I, I got to give it to him. He, from prosecutors to the mob guys, he played yeah. everybody yeah. like yeah. a fiddle because he was the one who orchestrated the hit on the prosecutor Yeah, and made it look like Vinny did. So he knew that he had nothing to give the government. He orchestrated it, pushed it, and, uh, you know, it shows he failed two lie detector tests. Well, so I want to I want to go a little bit more on the. OK, so 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 obviously Vinny made some surprisingly kind of sophomoric rookie mistakes. But again, if you go back to following protocol, the boss, the boss, so you can, like, you know, you could push and pull on that. And I get both sides of it. Right. Um, um, but at that point, at that point. You know, he jammed you up. I get that. And then obviously when Messino flips, but prior to, did you flip before Messino or did Messino flip first? No, M Messino flipped first. I got arrested actually with the feds did the morning they arrested me and then put, brought me to MDC Brooklyn. They put me under the Sam's act, which is like a terrorist act. Okay. There's yeah. no visits, no phone calls, no zero communication because they thought I was plotting to kill the, they thought I had the plot already in motion to kill and the process. So they had special dispensation. Got it. Okay. So what they did was the cell that Joe Messino was in, because the day they brought me in, that's when they moved Joe Messino out of the building and brought him into the Woodsack units. Interesting. The witness protection units in the feds. They put me in Joe Messino's holdings in his uh, cell. 
I'm like, you guys are dirty. They were dirty for doing that. But at the end of the day, um, but I want to, I want to, I want to be a little more detailed because, um, and it's going to sound crazy. I do believe you care about any, your, your uh, inflection changes. I do. I do. I do. There's some care there. Um, and I know this story and check out, and by the way, check out Dom's show. Um, he has his own show. He's got a lot of subs. He's got a lot of uh, good lies. He's got a lot of good stuff going on. Some stuff you may agree with. One stuff uh, you disagree with. One thing I think what makes you different is you're allowed to disagree with you. A lot of these other guys, you, yeah. you know, you can't disagree. Um, but, and if I'm wrong, I'll state I'm wrong. Yeah, That's exactly. another thing. Exactly. I'll go on live and I'll state it too, like I did recently. So, yeah. you know, not everybody's right all the time. And well, I can't, I, I can't do that. Then every show I would be five hours about how I was wrong, but that's another discussion. All right. So, so you get locked up and, you know, everybody kind of gives, and I'm just, just, you got to remember, I talked to a lot of associates. I probably interviewed one of the most of the mob guys. I definitely interviewed most of the made guys. The one thing that I keep recurring is, is like, Hey, I was prepared to do a flat 20. I was prepared to do this. And then you get presented with something much larger or you get screwed and you deviate. Right. So what happens is, and I respect your opinion and why you did it, but I want to go a little deeper because I want to feel it emotionally, if you will. You loved Vinny. When, when, how long was it when you got brought to federal detention to to flipping? How much time passed? Uh, 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 a you know, year. Time passed? A, a year. year. And then walk us through that year. Uh, we were having code. They kept Vinny and I separated. The only time we saw each other was during co-defendant meetings. Okay. And I would ask him, what's going on out there? Why did Michael dismantle my crew? That's my support. I'm not convicted. Yeah. And Vinny kept on saying, I don't know. I don't know. I asked him, what's going on with the sports money? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. What's going on with the body shop? I don't know. What's going on with my construction? I don't know. Because remember, they had me they had me tight that had zero communication with people, wow. especially for the first four months. Um, come to find out, I sent word out, uh, sports for the football season. Vinny received over $750,000. Half of that was mine. So I was like, and when I confronted him with it, oh, well, I don't know. And I know Vinny. Vinny's on top of everything. He, he's very anal. Yeah. Um, I asked him about other things. And he just sidetracked everything. And it got to the point where during one of our co-defendant meetings, he turns around to me because even my lawyers, I had Jeffrey Lippman represent me. Yeah. And Vinny wanted me to take the stand on our behalf at trial because he felt Joe Messino, Sal Vitale, they knew nothing about me. So they couldn't. And I had a lot of legitimate businesses on the street that I could talk my way out of it. And he felt I would come off good to the jurors. Interesting. And Jeffrey Littman told him, no way. No way. And Vinny wound up making me fire him. And that was my lead attorney. I had like four or five attorneys. Yeah. From him to James Vaccaro. Uh, you know, I had a powerhouse team. I had Mark Furnish on board. Oh, wow. They're not cheap either. <laughs> no, no. And I told Vinny, help me liquidate all my assets. I have about $10 million. They'll come back. I'll put yeah. $2 million towards all the attorneys. Yeah. And we'll fight the case. And it got to the point, uh, I just turned around, I told him I, that he turned around to me. He said, during the co-defendant meeting, do you, you blame me for you being in here? I turned around and said, absolutely, she kept your fucking mouth shut. Those were my exact words to him. With that, we both get up. The whole conference room cleared out. Attorneys, investigators, paralegals, they all left. The only one who stayed, remained there was Ace, Anthony Aiello. He was our co-defendant. Yeah. And Vinny and I went back and forth. He said, go do what the fuck you got to do. And he said that to Patty Filippo one time during a co-defendant meeting. So I told Vinny, I'm not Patty. I'm not a fucking rat. You're not going to label me or say something like that, like I'm a piece of shit. Yeah. And it got to the point I was inches away from swinging on him, putting my hands yeah. on him. Wow. And I held back so much. All of a sudden, I just started tears came out. Like I, I started just yeah. I couldn't emotionally. I sat down, put my hand in my head, and then he grabbed me, hugged me, said, "I'm sorry." Yeah. You know, like that was the first time we ever had a blowout. First argument out oh, of wow. the time we were together. 
And we we were with each other 24-7, literally, all the well, time. Well, I mean, so obviously you're living that situation. So you're going to look and feel because you're firsthand. I, I want to look at this. As, I want to give you a slightly different sure. twist, if you will. And it's not pushback. It's just a different view. Um, Messino, the, 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 the bananas were in shambles post um, correct peak connection, post commission, Donnie Brasco. It was a mess. We all know the story. Uh, Messino came in, stopped kissing each other, stopped going to funerals. Stopped going, so he built it back up, which it's interesting from a business perspective was genius. He brought it from a crew of like nobodies to like a powerhouse where the Genovese even admitted it's just us and Joe. So, so that's all documented. And I don't think we need to rehash that, but, but you, you, I believe and this a compliment, but this seems to be a knock on you that I, I asked people, I'm like, you know, I, I'm not trying to find a knock on Don, but what's the narrative, right? What's the narrative for him and against him? So, some of my sources are like, Hey, he might've got made a little quick and he might've gotten promoted quicker because of the power vacuum, you know, because of Cantarella, Copa, all those right. guys got kind of scooped away. There was a power vacuum. So the knock on you from my sources was you kind of got made a little too quick and you might have got it promoted quicker. What do you say to that, Tom? Um, they're right. They're okay. right. Um, what happened, though, I was supposed to be straightened out. I was around Vinny in 2000, in 1999. I think it was at the end of 2000, 2001, he put me in to be straightened out back then. Yeah. Under and, the right. And what happened was somebody, I think it was Michael No, somebody said, I just came home from jail for selling drugs. And Joe Messino had a five-year moratorium for drugs. Yeah. My, my understanding, so as Messino was building up, he kind of felt things were strong. And I was told he had a three criteria. One was no drugs. I don't know who had a moratorium, but no drugs. Yeah. Um, good lineage. So, like, if you know, the father's a wise right. guy, grandfather wise guy. And then the third is, you know, money guy, which I think right. we're starting to make some money. Right. Um, and, and, and I do want to touch on, and, and, and you kind of proved me a, a little wrong. My whole thing was, why weren't they making more money guys in the mob? Why didn't they keep them the money guys? And why didn't they become more of a legitimate organization? And, and when you and I first spoke, you're like, Tom, no, 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 you don't get it. Like you said, Messino needs the right recipe to make a burrata. Right. But keep those guys associates. They have the same power, the same money. Mm -hmm. You know what? Don't give them a gun. So walk us through what, what Messino had right and then what he had deadly wrong. Um, and I'm going to go back. Let me go back to because I answered your question about, yeah. uh, yes, I did excel accelerate real quick in the mafia. Yeah. But even Vinny, when he told people that because Joe Messino was the one that sent word to elevate me up as an official captain. Oh, okay. when, they made me, when Vinny... Tony Green sent word into Joe that Vinny wanted me to be an acting captain. Joe said yes. Okay. And I did accelerate quick. But Vinny's theory was to Tony Green when he proposed me to be his acting captain, Dominic's with me for the past four years. He's with me every single day. He knows the way I act. He knows everything about me. He knew the life prior. So he's seasoned. He's vetted. He would have been in the life in 2000, 2001, but because of his drug conviction, he couldn't, you didn't accept it. So he was around me. So that was Vinny's theory. But yeah. yes, to answer the question, go back to the original question. I was, yeah. I excelled real quick. Yeah, so because, because uh, as far as I know, Mafia doesn't give you a handbook and they don't have a great, Correct. Correct. <laughs> you know, so, so, so I do want to, I do want to, I do want to get to that. Um, about becoming a captain, especially amongst like your own crew and stuff. But but let's go back to um, the earlier part where um, you know he he was making more money, guys, but he was making them do work. Right. And, and you you told me on the phone back then. I'd rather you say it, where you were right on the recipe, but you were wrong on right. the ingredients. Well, the, he was shot because you do need guys like the San Gennaro feast was one of them. Yeah, Perry. Yeah, we, I call him a legitimate guy. Yeah, guys, a yeah. restaurant tour, five restaurants, yeah. very successful, yeah. fun and money. Yeah. But Joe felt, let me straighten him out, and that'll be our liaison to this San Gennaro feast. Yeah. I think even Giuliani complimented yeah, him. Again, the kid he, the that he was this made man. Yeah. So, you know, Joe had the right formula there. But I felt 
Joe put the wrong people in power. He knew his brother-in-law. He had to know his brother-in-law at one time as a corrections officer. Yeah. Um, and at one time, uh, back in the early 2000s, they gave me the contract to kill Sal. Joe was greenlighting it. Oh, wow. About two weeks before I'm supposed to hit him, Joe took it off the table. He told Vinny, I can't do it. My wife, that's my wife's brother. It'll cause too much tension with us and she'll never forgive me. So Joe took that off the table. But at the end of the day, um, listen, the guy brought the crime family from, from nothing yeah, to one a, of the pinnacle crime families up there with yeah. the Genovese. And yeah. then he destroyed it. He brought it back down. <laughs> and, you know, looking at everything hindsight, yeah, you only lived 10 years on the street. Yeah. And our thing was, even when you cooperate, Vinny and I would say, why? Like, we know he's sick. He's obese. He has diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. He eats like he has five assholes. Yeah. Like, he doesn't stop eating. He doesn't yeah. care for his health. Like, you're going to die in prison, yes, but you're not going to die at the age of 100. Yeah. You know, you, you'll be lucky if you get five or ten years if you have that left. Why? At least keep your head up high where – you know, the legacy you were left behind would have been yep. probably the best boss in history. Yep. And, and it's interesting because he died like the week of uh, De Niro, uh, uh, Matteo Messina De Niro died in Sicily. So he went on, you know, Italians do it differently. They go on the run right. and then they get caught and then he was sick and he could have rolled and he just said, you know, what? I'm going to die anyway. Let me die. Right. My point being is if you got caught 10 years ago, he knew he was going to die anyway. That That's what I, I find interesting where I, like that John Bologna, I know, died a few years after he was an associate on the West Side. But but my point being is uh, if you look at the outcomes of informants, like if you really look at how do they really end up, right. a lot of them wind up dying 5, 10, 15 years later. And some of them, they kind of either knew they would die or I'm wondering if the stress associated with that accelerates you know, accelerates their um, stress their does accelerate. Yeah. But, so, um, okay. So we talked about how, you know, Messina brought it up. We talked about Messina brought it down. So when you prior to getting made, what were your revenue streams? What business were you doing and what type of money were you making gross? If you don't mind me asking, I was doing everything. I had an auto repair shop, um, real estate office. I had the real estate offices. We were doing titles, mortgages, uh, insurance, uh, construction company, tile company. I had a bar lounge. I was in, I had a lot of legitimate businesses. And then we had the sports book, a massive, massive sports book. What, what percentage were you legit at prior to getting made? What percentage? What percentage you, you legitimate revenue versus illegitimate? Was 80% legit? What percentage were you um, legit? I would say 80% was legit, that 20%, but that sports book was massive. Massive. Uh, so any given week, uh, I could put in my pocket three, four hundred thousand. Jeez. All right. And that was split four ways. Yeah. So, OK, so then you get made. Where were you made in, in the Bronx? I was made at uh, Anthony Donato's home in uh, Westchester. Tell us about that experience. Um, to me, it wasn't. I don't know. It just didn't, I didn't feel different. Vinny asked afterwards, hey, you feel any different? I said, no. Like, mm -hmm. what's different? Yeah. Because I was, remember, I was around, who straightened me out was Tony Green. Yeah. Uh, Joe Camarano Sr. He was there. Patty DiFilippo. Because yeah. he straightened out a little, pa another Patty. Yeah. Uh, Vinny was there. So they were all like, um, do you feel different? No, because I was around those guys every single day. So it was with Tony guy. Green, uh, Joe Camerano, and I was in their company. I was privy to a lot of things I shouldn't have been privy to at that time. So, so you were they high, would treat high, me high. like I was straightened out. Yeah. Like I would consider that like a high-level associate. You don't have to say their names, but how many people were you made with that day? Uh, there was about four of us. And then it's always funny. It's always in fours. Is that is that like don't you get a certain allocation every year? And that's what they yeah, did? Five a year. Them? Yes. Five it was year. five a year. And they had a policy, if you don't use them, you lose them. Oh. Vinny had that changed. Because Vinny said, why would you – we have guys coming home from jail maybe the following year. Yeah. Why would you have us put guys who aren't qualified just for numbers? Yeah. Wouldn't it be wiser that we save them and then we use them for the proper guys? They all agreed, and that's what happened. 
policy change. So without saying names, the three other guys in jail, alive, active, inactive, dead. Where, where are those three guys now? You don't have to say their names. All alive. All alive on the street. Okay. Um, you get made and, you know, whether it be Vinny or somebody who are you going to just sit to you and say, now, you know, you get money for half point. Here's, you now get the keys. In it. Like what, what access or what changed for you materially after you got your button? Nothing. Nothing. So was it it? Yeah, you seem that you out of all the guys I interviewed, both with and without a button, you seem to hold the button in lesser regard. Is that a because fair it's statement? the person? It's the person. Okay. All that button that to me that's all bullshit. Um, yeah. always was. Even yeah. when I went after TG, who was a captain of the Lucchese crime family, I wasn't made. And Vinny told no, him TG was in your borgata, right? No, there was a, another TG, oh, another TG for yeah, in the Lucchese. Okay. And Vinny told him, he said. If Dominic, number one, let everybody in the Bronx know somebody wants to call Dominic a rat or say something bad about Dominic, and if Dominic don't fuck them up, Dominic can't even be around me. Matter of fact, I would kill Dominic. Wow. And if I'm with Dominic and he's fucking up a friend, I'm going to help him. Wow. Because that's a man. A man sticks up for his pride, his his manhood. If Dominic wouldn't have did anything right now, he can't be around me because that's a mutt. That's somebody who has no inner. So, so here's my thing, though. And again, kind of go back to what you said earlier. It seems like the expectation is these rules, but the reality is a little more fluid. So when things went sideways for you, because we're going to get to poor leadership in a minute, which is another discussion we'll get, we'll get mm -hmm. to. Things were fluid that worked against you. Why were you so surprised that you saw like kind of fluidity here and then the rules became fluid for you against you. You seem surprised by it. Why were you surprised? Were you surprised? And you're talking so, about when I got locked up. Yeah, that because I feel like I feel like I'm I'm believing right. everything you're saying. And if I'm taking it in good faith, you got screwed because you have the, you didn't have a stipend. They didn't protect your businesses. They didn't provide counsel. You know, maybe they didn't take care of your wife. The things you would expect as a man of honor. No, right? all I all I expected. My properties, the construction sites I had, the real estate yeah. office, the bar lounge. Just keep it. Yeah, keep it they sold the things. They sold it. Kept the money. They sold everything. Buildings. They took out of my name. Four yeah. Let years. me let me ask. Let me ask the two the two legitimate guy for his own good. A place is in your name. How does a mob get it out of your name and sell it? Did they force your wife to sign it no, over? No. They had they, they had the Robert Van. Well, I'm going to talk now. Robert Van Zandt's past. Okay. He was Can Vinny's you? guy. So, oh, so they had their connections with a title company, a lawyer. Oh, okay. Of course. Yeah, but could, could we could we could we argue you may never had this stuff if you weren't with the Borgata? Can you make that argument or no? Well, you could argue it any way you want, but I, I was an earner. I was an yeah. earner all the yeah. time. Yeah. And I just got upset because, again, loyalty is a two-way street. Vinny's Correct. talking about murders. My boss is wearing a wire. The other boss on the street just says, I have nothing coming. I'm in here because of the family. Remember, the murders I did weren't because of Dominic Sicali. Correct. And I had issues These were administration. because of the crime family. Yeah, yeah. Whether Vinny had the okay to kill the first guy or not, yeah. Vinny acted. I was there. I was there. Well, with far, yeah. Uh, well, because as far as but as far as you're concerned, he is the crime family. He's your boss, right? If he right. gives you an order, that's the crime family, correct. right? Okay. And um, at that time, on the first murder, I was an associate with him. Yeah. So whatever he tells me, who am I to question? Okay, so one thing I always found interesting is my experience, again, could, your years could have been different. I always felt that um, the mob was very cutthroat when it came to illegitimate stuff, like you go away or something happens, they put their hands in. But they generally laid off the illegitimate stuff. It looks like they put your hand in your legitimate assets as well, correct? They had them in the illegitimate. No, not even. The Let me um, correct that. Yeah. Vinny was getting the money from the legit illegal stuff. He yeah. just tend to keep everything. Got it. Um, and then what happened? Yeah, they they took everything from me. I mean, just it was just like a field day for everybody. At least wait till I'm convicted. Yeah. At least wait for that. And so the other, I, just, yeah. I just had a sour taste in my mouth with that. It was well, just dirty. The other the other part is the reason why structures fail, obviously, by having the wrong structure but having the wrong people whether and, we like it whether we like it or not post messino the leadership 
was way off versus exactly. Missouri. So that and, was an issue. And I have a good point too. Please. I'm a captain. I had a crew of over 20 people in my crew. Yeah, that's crazy. Because I got the guys from Richie Cantarello's crew. I was getting all different people. Yeah. Out of my crew, 30 people were locked up. Joe Torre was locked up. Yeah. I think um, there was a few other people. Altogether, I was going for $3,500 a month. I was sending everybody $500 each for commissary. Wow. I didn't have to do that, but I know how it is. I yeah. was always fair. I was always yeah. somebody, I have your back. You're my brother. I got your back. You're in my Dejean. Correct, correct. You're going to get this. And I just felt, where is the loyalty? Like, I've always guided myself like that with respect and got my brother's back. I'll help you out any way I can. Yeah. I'm there for you. And I'll give you a scenario. Nikki Santoro. His son-in-law owed me $5,000. Yeah. I'm locked up. I send word out, Nick, could you please get the money? Have him yeah. send. Come to find out, Nicky sends word back. He sent maybe 500 The rest he kept. He said, Dom, I needed the rest of the money. I'll pay you when I can. Well, and, and his, uh, his, uh, ne- his uh, son-in-law wasn't a friend, right? No. His son-in-law was married to his daughter. He was, I think, in the plumbing business. But but if I understand protocol, Nikki should have gave you the money, and then he should correct, have correct. That's what I mean. The wrong people in wrong yeah. positions. But how are you going to tell me you need the money? I'm the one looking at a death penalty case, and you needed cash. So okay, so we talk about poor leadership, which is in spades post Messino, but then also poor structure. Because I always try to think rationally, right? So you're a street guy, you're an Italian guy. Don't get me wrong; it doesn't get. You know, it's the Ivy League, but in the you know two, late two thousands, you probably would have been okay. You probably would still be on the street if you if you didn't get made, right? But so here's what I don't get: I always thought, okay, you can't touch you, right? That's one option. That's a good thing. Maybe get access to cash. You got a brigada behind you, but you hit the nail on the head. I talked to guys that off camera that are. Well, I heard you don't get it nowadays if you go to jail and you're a friend, you don't get an envelope every month, and it's very captain-specific, not even Borgata-specific. So if you have a good captain, like a Bill Cotolo, you went away, he paid you. Probably Persco didn't even know about it. Versus every other Borgata, it matters by the captain, not the family. Is that your understanding as well? It matters about the guys. That's correct. And yeah. I'll give a for instance. Even Quiet Dom, when he was sitting there with me, they, he had a public defender representing him. He didn't need it. They gave. They had two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for him for a lawyer. He oh, said, man. "Guys, I'm old. Yeah. I don't need a good. I don't need a good lawyer. This is a bullshit case. I'll get a few years, and that's it. So, yeah. don't worry about. It. Don't waste your money. But that that's what the mafia is supposed to be like. That's what you you're supposed to have that support, that brotherhood. But you but don't. I want, but I want I want to jar that up because you know I I talk to, um. And I, I think he says it best, Anthony Arolada. He said, and we're not that far in age, but he he said, he goes, if you're over 50, you caught the glory days. You saw the guys in the suit, the social club, the Cadillac. Under 50, and I'm getting getting there, but under 50, because I really didn't see it. it I caught the tail end of it. You didn't see us much, right? Like at that point, it was a shit show, especially in the 90s. The Cavacantes got decimated in New Jersey. But my point being is, when did it turn? Like, like we could argue push and pull, but for 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 you, you went in the life in the early two thousands, obviously to pick up the scraps and continue right. on from somewhat of a legacy. But when did it really turn to become just a shit show, if you will? This is going to be listen. So it turned for me when I got locked up. Okay, that's when I saw there was nothing. Vinny did have it. Vinny tightened the ship when he was out there. Yeah, had everybody in line. Um, even when Tony Green was running the show, it was really Vinny was behind the scenes. Yeah. Because he was, I mean, confiding with him with everything, going over every decision he made. So Vinny would suggest something, Tony would follow through with it. Um, so it was Vinny pulling everything together, making everything tighter, where it didn't feel like, okay, we got hit with maybe 10 people that cooperated. Yeah. Didn't affect us. We were on the street. Let's pull the reins. Let's tighten everything up. Yeah, And so really, I didn't notice anything. I felt nothing skipped a beat. 
I was still doing my thing. And remember, I'm not a social club guy. I wasn't in social yeah. clubs. I don't go to card games. Yeah, That's yeah. not my thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and to me, the button never meant anything. It, it was just because it's the man. Deep down, it's the man. Like Vinny said, they could have 100 guys. All I need is three. We'll yeah. do more damage with my three than their 100. I, I, I also felt that um, – the banana squad was kind of an enigma. You kind of go back to like the Knickerbocker, you know, kind of Sicilian days. And then it kind of morphed into got very strong in the Bronx. Um, and, and I actually talked to a former um, OC guy that covered the bananas. There was a point they were unsure if the numbers were 120 or 200. Like you remember when that guy? Um, yeah, it's up. To, we're up. They were bananas are up to two hundred. Yeah, and, and and they and they couldn't like bridge right. the eighty gap. I don't know if you remember, but remember that guy Cagno got shot at, and I think it was because of the Meldish thing in Harlem. When he went in, he's like, "I'm causing Ostra." The OC guys they didn't have a sleeve on them, and I don't think the feds did either. And they were like, right. you know. So I always felt like you, the advantage you guys had was might have been that like kind of Sicilian heritage, and also kind of being in the Bronx. Right, and um, let me. Yeah, and please. also to answer your question, you yeah. were talking about it being disheveled and yeah. the substance. I'm the only rat of substance, made guy, I think, out of the Bronx. I I, I, I I don't have, I did some research. I don't believe there has been ever a made member that has informed or been a cooperating witness as far as I know. And I researched it pretty heavy. Out of the Bronx. Out of the Bronx, correct. So, out of, Bronx all, five, all five families, I believe. All right. five families. The Bronx is tight. So yeah, I, yeah. all the stuff that went on in Queens, yeah. Brooklyn, this one's rotten, that one's rotten. We yeah. have to watch out. Everybody going chaotic. We didn't have that in the Bronx. It's still tight. Yeah, that's It's crazy. still a tight neighborhood. Now, at that time, um, the Albanians were very strong. I know the Gambinos were pretty close with them. Um, did you respect them as the kind of the sixth family? Were they uh, uh, subservient to you guys? How the Bronx were, again, particularly in the Bronx, Albanians were strong. How did they, how were they versus the Italians back then? Uh, they were good with uh, Vinny, myself. Okay, they had a lot of respect for us. They tried making a move on a Colombo guy. Okay, who was very close with us. We told them no. Oh, wow. they backed up. Um, but you know, it works both ways. Yeah. But at one point, and it, it, this is a fact. Yeah. We were gonna kill them. Vinny couldn't take the fact. Vinny's very egotistical. Okay. Um. And he was upset when they smacked the guy, Joe Gambino, took his social club out of the Bronx. Oh, wow. And the guy's a Lucchese guy, and he didn't do anything. He was Lucchese a made guy? Didn't do anything. Yes. Wow. Yes, he was. And word got back to Joe. This is years later. Vinny wants to roll on them and was, have everything set up. Word got to Joe. Joe called for Vinny and told him, no, that's their wow. problem. And Vinny's thing, no, it's Cosa Nostra. Yeah, we should all be there for one another. And Joe didn't want to hear it. Um, yeah, but and the funny know. part is, the funny part is I watch your show, and, and it might have been post-Casso, but my point being is, at one point, the Lucchese's were probably the most dangerous family. I see, they yes, they were. Yes, that's they not, were. That's not happening under the Casso era. No. N hell no. <laughs> <laughs> no way. He's wiping out. Listen, the day it happened, that day he's wiping everybody out. There's so, no doubt. Him and Vic. So, okay, so you're in MDs, you're in the lockdown, you, you know, the case, now is a case, like, so you, you have an idea, you have an attorney, you're also a smart guy, people can say what they want about you, but you're an intelligent guy. How did you feel your chances were, aside from getting screwed over and stuff, how did you feel your chance, you think you were going to blow trial, did you think you had a chance, or, and also the, was the case getting worse for you, or did it get better, because I want to get, before you flip, I want to get that gestation period of what, what you thought your chances were um i'm a fighter so i i would say i'm going to beat the case yeah. but however i we all felt listen they offered Vinny a plea deal what 27 it, years uh, 27 years okay for both cases okay two homicides 27 years we'll wrap it up Vinny didn't want to take it wow um, why why Vinny's like they have nothing on me i'm beating the case but you're on tape Vinny. he didn't want to hear it yeah and that was it. But um, at the end of the day, I think I would have had a plea. I would have got a plea. So you I get feel a chance. maybe yeah. for most twenty years. Um, and then if I go to trial, you know, my defense, even Jeffrey Lippman, would be, 
Vinny didn't. Vinny's on tape talking about me killing somebody, but I'm at a basketball game that night. Doesn't mean I'm on TV. So because I had courtside seats, I had season tickets for the Nets. So it wasn't like I went to a game just to cover up. These are my season tickets. So you're in jail for a year. You think you have a shot? If not, yeah, and it may not be a life sentence. Walk me through before you're headed to Pillow the night before. You ask for the prosecutor and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to join Team USA. What was going through your head the night before? I was sick. Sick to my stomach. That I, I just was sick. I saw the writing on the wall with everything. Um, and my thing was, now if I wind up with some time, listen, there's always a possibility I could end up with a life sentence. I'm not yeah. going to kid myself. Yeah. And if I wind up with a life sentence... Now I have nothing. You stripped me of everything on the street. Yeah. I'm in here because of the family. I just got fed up with everything. I said, you know, I'm done. And yeah. that was it. I was sick, though. I was sick. And it broke my heart leaving Dom that day. I'll never forget it. Like, I gave him all my stuff. I made an excuse to him. They're bringing me to MCC. They're bringing Vinny here. Wow. And I was just sick. I, I was really, uh, I just it broke my heart. He even walked me out to the door. Well, so because you felt ill and because even to this day, you know, you can hear it. it it's upsetting to you. It's just, you're human, right? You still felt some attachment. Give us the things you were attached to from the life and being uh, a member. The life itself, just the respect. Yeah. Just the respect that people have for you. I mean, yeah. through the prison system, remember, I just came off a 10-year bid five years prior yeah. I had the respect. I actually, what's his name was even there in our unit? Um uh Kevin McGriff, Supreme. Yeah, Supreme, yeah, Supreme team. And I go back with him through the prison system. So, yeah. you know, I had a great name, good reputation, streets yeah. too. My family's in the Bronx. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's just that that was the most troubling. My reputation, my name, everything I built. That uh, that hurt. So you cooperate. How many times did you actually take the stand? I think five trials. Can you go through each if you don't mind? Um, it was just prepping, going up. Okay. And saying what I had to say. The last trial, I think, was the John Gotti Jr. trial. Got it. Um, where it was just, I never met the guy. Yeah. Um, it was just about what him and Vinny concocted. As far as uh, John Guy Jr. wanted Joey D'Angelo to take the stand on his behalf. Yeah. And Vinny wanted me to take the stand. So, you know, they said, this is the new way. When I brought it to other people, they said, Dom, that's suicide. Everybody's going to look at you as a rat. Yeah. I said, I know that. But so, uh, so Junior, Junior, Junior got off. Did you testify against Vinny? Yes. And four, I think, pretty sure it's four trials. Uh, wow. Vinny, Patty D. Filippo, the first trial. Then Vinny's retrial. Uh, I'm not sure death penalty phase. Vinny's second. It might have been four trials I testified in. So you're on the stand against your former brother. Um, you know, just I, I think about it and I'm getting chills, you know, but you'd lived it. What mm -hmm. was what was going th you know through your head? How were you feeling? It bothered me, but I had to, I knew now it's just self-preservation i'm saving myself i'm doing what i committed to with the government yeah. and that's it you know and it, listen at one point barry levin and i like barry smiled because he said something well mr sakali i said yes mr levin and he started laughing yeah when he told him in front of the jury like i'm facing the death penalty and you're having jokes you're joking with him yeah like he was really upset but yeah so, okay, so you testify, you, you know, in some cases the government wins, they don't. One of the things that um, I don't think people appreciate as much, people think that you have a lot of cards, you know, to play with and a lot of negotiating where you could be like, you know what, Sam, you'll be like, I'm going to talk, but I'm not talking about my old crew. And they make it look like, you know, they That's have this bullshit. leverage. That's yeah, all I bullshit. That, I want to dispel... That's all bullshit. Yeah, yeah. That's all bullshit. All because I tried saving Ace Anthony Aiello. Yeah. Government said, Dom, worry about yourself. And he's a big boy. He can do what he has to do. You worry about yourself. And the government doesn't tell you who you're testifying against. 
Yeah. When you debrief, when you go in, because you don't know who's, what cases are coming out. So to say what you just said, well, the government only told me I have to do him. I made the deal, save this one. Once you give information, you didn't save anybody. You gave information on that person. So you don't know what comes out with that information. You don't know what it leads to. Yeah. So that's all BS. So after testifying, did you go into the uh, program? Uh, they put me, it's mandatory. They, in the federal custody, while I was in federal custody, they have a phase one of the witness protection program. A special PC, right? Yeah. Yes. They have about seven different facilities. Yes. Correct. Yes. Throughout the country. And that's where they placed me. Uh, when I was released, no, I did not go into phase two. Got it. Now, when you were in phase one, were you with any other Cosa Nostra informants? Yes, I was. Uh, maybe Sammy uh, the Bull was one of them. Did you play chess with him? No, we didn't play chess. I play checkers. I know he plays chess. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, we can unpack that well. Uh, well. We'll talk about Sammy in a minute. Um, how was the camaraderie with um, you know other organized crime guys in PC? Because is it kind of like a spectrum where like he's more of a rat than you, or like? Or you like? Oh, you have all. You listen. I was with Bobby Luisi. I was with yeah. um, I Nicholas know. Calabrese. Okay, yeah. Uh, I was with Joe Caves. There, there was a lot of different people. Um, Got it. You know, some you have conflict with, some you don't. Um, you know, some still have that mafia mentality. Yeah. Now you get out, right? So you get out. Um, tell us about like what assets can you keep? Like, did you get to keep? And where did you live? Well, I had no assets. I told you they stripped me of everything. Like everything? Everything, everything, everything. Yikes. Everything. I came out, the government handed me $25,000, and that was it. You know, my mother gave me twenty-five, dollars and. Where did you go? Crazy. That was basically it. I was going to be with my daughter's mother. We planned on staying together, and uh, long and short. I was living with her sister while I was in the halfway house. Yeah. Uh, they gave me home confinement immediately. So I was staying there for three months. Then after that, I just got an apartment, wound up meeting my wife, and that was it. So I was always um, a follower. I'm friendly with Ed Scarpo. Um, you wrote a book with him. Uh, you want to plug that book? Because I don't think the pe more people should be aware of the first book you wrote with that. What was yeah, it? I think the Sakali Files. Yeah, it's part? a shorter book. It's a nice read. It's an e-book, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and uh, uh, Ed's a um, good journalist. Uh, great journalist. guy, great guy, Ed. I love him, really. Yeah, so I, I've been following you even before you came on the YouTube, and you had a fairly successful business life. I think there's, you know, people that know me, I care about the business end of things. I try to extract the moral to, to make a better life for myself and to learn from your mistakes and others' mistakes. But right. you learn from your own mistakes and you build a pretty nice, legitimate business foundation. Give us your first like few moves, and then what did you do to kind of you know turn your life around? Well, a legitimate guy from my past. He's one of my only friends, uh, a Jewish fella. Okay. Uh, always remained in touch with me while I was incarcerated. I came home, and we're close. Even the family's close. He calls me up. He says, Dom, now at this time, I'm getting involved in entertainment. He says, Dom, I have a construction job for you. And I tell him, no, nah, I'm not interested. Dom, you could have the whole job. I'm not interested. Dom, it's a $200 million job. I'll <laughs> see. I'll, I'll be down there tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, exactly. That put me right back on the map. I did that. I was down there for two years working it. Um, and 700 homes. And oh, wow. With that, the developer wound up selling out the project to Lenar, uh, but I it, it and then Lenar went bankrupt. <laughs> it put me back on my feet with that job. And then you got into some pretty interesting stuff. I saw you in the private plane. You were going to like Sierra Leone to like save the water. Like, <laughs> yeah, was, we were doing water projects in yeah. uh, Sierra Leone, yeah. Pakistan. That was the plane in Pakistan. We were doing things with the largest land developers in Pakistan. Oh, wow. Also Guatemala. I was sitting down with presidents, vice presidents of those countries. And uh, yeah. it became in Sierra Leone. It was a business opportunity. 
that wound up turning into a humanitarian effort. Philanthropic, yeah. The exactly. government never paid me for our services, and I wound up donating and constantly fueling the machine, helping the kids, doing things for that country, nice. bringing medical equipment to their country, a lot of different things. Now, tell me if you, and you're welcome to disagree, but tell me if you agree with this statement. The mob in the U.S. had kind of a, a, a crossroad because when there were neighborhoods, if it made sense to be super local, I get it. Boston, every block, local stuff, Shylocking, not going to have a huge international presence, right? Right. But then as the neighbor dissipates, there goes that, right? But right. then never was progressive enough. And I hate drugs. I don't do drugs. I lost a brother to drugs. But we weren't progressive enough to say, hey, you know what? There's billions in drugs. Maybe we go international to get that money from drugs or other stuff like projects. The mafia in the U.S. never went international, unlike the Italian mob or the Indraga that's in six different you know, um, uh, uh, continents. Was there a part of you while you're on that plane and while you're talking to vice presidents and governors and so forth in these countries, was there a part of you like, shit, if I was still a friend, the bananas could have expanded? Why Why didn't the U.S. Cosa Nostra expand internationally, expand into bigger verticals? That's the one area... I never understood. I would say um, from looking back, they're not that sharp. You have at least 60%. They're, to me, they're buffoons. They just, they're still on street corners fighting for that same quarter. They don't have the wayward. They don't have the intellect to, to advance. And to answer your question, I didn't even think of it. That's, that's the first time I'm hearing of it. Now you have me thinking, but I never even thought of it. And I had friends of mine, I would send them pictures, very successful people. I mean, they're wealthy from my childhood. And they would be like, Dom, only you. Only you could be sitting down with presidents in different countries. You come home, you don't know anybody. And two years later, you're sitting down with a president of a country. Like how? Only you. Yeah, because I, I would argue, I would argue for the most part that most people that, informed or, or change your life in Italy. They actually call them pentito, which means repentant one. Okay. So, so, so I would argue that you probably are one of the more successful former guys. Cause a lot of these other guys aren't, you know, you don't make a lot on YouTube as you know, you don't make a lot doing other stuff. Right. So why do you think you might've been more successful than the other eight guys that I interviewed? Um, when I do something, I'm in it 110%. So that's why I excelled so quick in the mafia. I'm there. I put my all into it. I'm not lazy. Even nowadays, I'm up at 3, 3.30 in the morning, and I'm working. That's when I get my best work done, and I'm at the gym at 6. So it's just um, embedded in me. I don't like failing. And there's times I do fail. I make a wrong decision in an investment. It happens. You know, I'm human. Yeah. But the majority of the times I'm successful and I just, I don't stop. I keep on moving forward. And don't get me wrong. There's a lot of times I get depressed. I'm down. Uh, even speaking to some of my guys from New York, from my past life. I don't like hearing you like that. Come on, pick yourself up. Like, you know, it gets disheartening because I don't have the resources I once had. So I'm basically working half, half loaded to, to say, Instead of on a, with a full car, I'm working with a half car. And some things, there's a lot of shortfalls I come up with. But at the end of the day, I feel I'm blessed. I'm out in the free world, breathing the fresh air. And that's it. God will provide for me one way or another. Give me the strength to move forward. And, uh, you know, maybe he knocks me down to keep me humble at times. That's the way I feel. Yeah, but you, you, we talked about this um, earlier. Um where respectfully, I'm not, it's not a knock at anybody, but I probably interviewed maybe 30 or 40 people in the life, including or even prosecutors, tangential. But of the nine guys that I've interviewed, of those guys were smarter. You could just tell or more sophisticated or just right. all put together and knew how to maneuver. Um, one of the things I liked that you did was you do have sponsors for your show. You got EG Vodka, um, Champagne La Rock, and you're trying to build a platform. Where Correct. a lot of other guys are worried about like super chats or doing like Zoom <laughs> and all this other stuff, but you kind of got it right. Um, tell us a little bit about AG Vodka. You, you know, you, you get respectful, came on and gave me an hour of your time. Take a Thank second. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. I, I really do. 
E.G. Vacher, there's six of us. We all own 16.6% of the company, so we're the majority nice. shareholders. Nice. Uh, it's 100% organic, gluten-free. You could go to egvaca.com. Okay. We ship in 44 states now. Um, and it's really a – I'm a vodka drinker. Yeah. And every time I go out, if I'm in a local restaurant, they have our vodka. I'll see somebody at the bar. They'll – be getting a kettle or a gray goose or Tito's. You have to try this one guy last week. And this is a true story. Yeah. He tried the vodka right away. He says, how do I buy it? He went online, bought three bottles. I said, get oh, out wow. of here. And I wound up picking up his check. He said, you don't have to. I said, no, I do. Because what you did. Thank you. And that's a customer I know we'll have for a long time, but it was just a, uh, an opportunity that I had that was offered to me and I took advantage of it. And it's really, uh, I've been blessed. That's why I say God is just sometimes, like I said, I'm not always in a good mood. Things always don't go good for me. Things, you know, sometimes are tight. I'm down, but you know, I just keep my head up high and I'm, I'm just blessed to be out, be free. My family's okay. And that's all that matters nowadays. So, um, and the reason why I brought it up is, and you're welcome to share this or not. Um, so you started your platform. I think you're like 19,000 subs, which is a nice number, especially considering you, you weren't doing this too long. Um, are you seeing correlation of your platform and seeing good vodka sales or did not hit that correlation yet? Well, what happened was uh, a week prior, we weren't, we were only in 13 states. Oh, so I have a lot of people come and Dom, I can't buy it. Dom, I can't buy it. Dom, I can't yeah. buy it. So now what I'm doing is <clears throat> we're going to be setting up a subscription base too, Smart. where I give all people a discounted rate and yeah. uh, just put the product out there, get it out there, get it in people's hands. Awareness yeah. and awareness because my, my partners and myself, we're not concerned about a profit. Yeah. We want to put it out there, put the awareness and it'll build itself. Yeah, that's smart. And they, they actually kind of did that with, um, obviously, the celebrities behind it, but like Casamigos, which sold out for over a billion dollars. Oh, and, like, and they, uh, I don't even think they sold 7,000 cases at that time. Well, that's, 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 that's what, what, well, that's what's crazy. So, like, I, I find, see, people are watching you and they're like, I want to hear about, like, you know, Joey Three Feet from the Bronx. <laughs> no, I want to hear about how you're leveraging your platform. <laughs> flip it to a billion dollar brand. I just think differently. I don't know, but no, it's listen, it's all about business at the end yeah. of the day. And you know what? Like I tell people, this is my therapy coming yeah. on. It helps me. Yeah. And I like people. I want the negative comments to come yeah. in. As long as they're respectful, you know, you'll get an intellectual negative comment. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. And if I'm wrong, I'll say, you know what? You're right. I can't answer it. You're right. What was a comment that sticks out to you? That was super critical, but respectful that you said, hey, you know what? I I, I hate you, but you know what? You're not wrong. Is it uh, one that jumps out of you? Somebody was talking about with Vinny, how could you say you love him? You're a hypocrite. You're this, you're that. I said, well, listen, I'm with a guy for five, six years every day. Yeah. I love him. Like if he died right now, I'd be upset. I'd be really upset. Like I don't yeah. want to see him die in prison. This was a business decision. It wasn't personal. If there's anything I could do for him, I would do it. But I'm not going to get on a witness stand and lie. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to jeopardize my freedom. That's not going to happen. You have a lifetime deal with the government, meaning so if he retrials, is there an expiration or you got to do it for life? I'm pretty sure everybody has a lifetime deal with the government. It just depends how you act on the stand. I'm not going to act any differently. If I did that, I would be a hypocrite right now yeah. saying I've changed. Because, listen, I had family members make statements. He won't last three years out there. He'll go back. A leopard doesn't change his spots. Well, let me tell you something. I've changed my spots. I've learned yeah. to adapt, to acclimate, to be a regular law abiding citizen. And that's the way it is nowadays. So also media is kind of funny because media is a tough beast, as you know. And you and I chatted briefly about what happened with Sammy. I know you guys are at odds. Um, you know, in the YouTube world, people don't understand this. You're supposed to collaborate with each other, whether you like each other or not, to build a platform. Exactly. So what happened with Sammy and kind of unpack that a little bit? Um, I'm okay with everything. As long as somebody's straight up with me. Sammy brought me down. I spoke with him. I wanted to do things with him. I felt we could collaborate and help each other. And Sammy's thing was, Dom, come on my show. 
We'll film down here. I'll put it out on my YouTube for the public and it'll help build up your show. This was in the beginning. He held it for about four or five months. Then he puts it, when he puts it out, he puts it behind his wall. So I was like, Sammy, you never said that. And with that, um, there was a falling out. I called yeah. him out on it. I said, you're dirty. That's dirty. It's disgusting. He wouldn't even take my text message, get on a phone call. He had his, his pit bull, Anna, get on and talk to me. Anna's like, why are you upset? Why am I upset? Well, no, you're getting hits. You're getting views. No, it's behind his paid wall. It was supposed to be on the yeah, internet. 300 people. 300,000. Well, but so here's the thing, and this is what I find interesting, is in – a normal situation, what I know of you or even myself, I would have had some type of, I have written agreements now. Well, I used to be a handshake guy. Right. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't become an agreement guy in writing, not because I got screwed, believe it or not. It's just more when you and I argue, it's that possession arrow. Oh, we right. agreed for 90 days versus 120, just so we don't have a, a convenient memory. Right. I would think you would have an agreement nine time out of 10, with Sammy saying, hey, I'm coming in. We're going to join. I would, I would have never expected him to do something that low. Yeah. All he had to do, Tom, Dom, do you mind if I put it behind my paid wall? Yeah, you do for and 30 then, days. The play is you put it for 30 days to build up the momentum. Then it gets released. Then, gets I would say, go ahead, Sammy. Wants. Do you make money off of it? Go ahead. So I know you have to pay the bills. I know that was your expense, you know, having the film guys there and everything. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, you have a clawback. And he wasn't even man good. enough to say that. So that's why he got the nickname as Scammy. <laughs> well, <laughs> but that's the thing. I mean, I, you know, I dealt with him a little bit. I'm, I'm friends with his sister. I mean, sister's daughter. Um, I always had good experience with Karen. But yeah, yeah a little Karen's surprised. a sweetheart. She's, yeah. she's really a nice person. So, and then you had a Patreon with Jeff. Unfortunately, you know, I understand it didn't work out. What, give us kind of you know, what you see your model like. Cause I, I, I'm telling you, I, it's not that I don't like the Patreon model. It's not that I don't like it, but you need like, you know, a thousand people to make money. I like sponsors, occasional super right. chat. Give us kind of your model moving forward and what people should expect from your channel. Um, I'm trying something new. I'm trying to come out with something every day. I'm going to come cool. out with workout things, sure. health segment. We have the uh, medical platform now for you erectile saying, dysfunction. Yeah. Um, so wait, wait, so your guy, your guy does what? Uh, ED, uh, 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 erectile dysfunction. Yes, it's for ED, erectile dysfunction. They could go to themanshot.com. Everything's confidential. Oh, cool. Um, I mean, we're doing nice things. I want to be like, maybe have mafia, but a Joe Rogan type where yeah. we bring people on. We're talking. Everybody yeah. could feel free to say what they want, be opinionated, get into heated discussions, debates. Yep. And it's healthy, I think, for the for the genre and yep. just expanding. Not that you need my uh, not my advice, because you're 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 a smart guy, but um I, I come from a marketing background, I have an agency. Um I can tell you, and this is what I do for a living, men in our demographic from 35 to as high as 65 are the highest and the hardest to get to, but have the most disposable income. So, like, my thing is if you build a platform of men's interest, now you got to work your niche, right? You're the mafia right. guy, so you build it up 25, 30, 50,000 subs. But, like, once you kind of hit critical mass, you insert, you know, a, a male performance doctor, you know, liquor guy. And then the other part is, which I think is underrated, I would like a Joe Rogan-type format with a mafia guy outlook on – you remember that trial with Theranos where she they created this fake blood thing and made right. it a million dollar company and then this I want to hear your take on that. You're like, wow, that's a good scam. Like I right, 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 right. Your perspective on that. So I think I'm really excited to see you not only your mafia stuff, because there's not a lot of stuff from the Bronx, but I'm really interested to see your outtake on other stuff with men's interests, because men are hard to get to, Dominic. And I think right. you realize that. Tom, I'm open for anything. I'm open. Yeah. Listen, I know I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I have a lot of common sense. Even doing us doing something together. Yeah. But as a group, bring yeah. a group together where yeah. it's entertaining. Everybody has different views, different questions. Yeah. And that's what makes it interesting. Like, I don't want people agreeing just being yes boys. 
Well, I like the conflict. Yeah, I, I, that's the thing. I think I don't think it echoed. Actually, I'm not like the I got you guy. Like we talked earlier, like ask questions, see where it right. goes. Right, and I told you, ask me whatever you want. I don't care. Surprise me. Correct. I'm good and, with that. And just with so other you people, know, they won't do that. And just so you know, I um not just mafia guys, but the bigger names. I interviewed like Pablo Escobar's wife. I interviewed right. Totorina, his son, who first ever wow. U.S. interview. I think it was some pretty big names. And I'm not knocking anybody. But the bigger you go or the more serious you go, it comes with a list of demands. They have their demand list. Hey, you could ask this. You can't ask that. First thing Dominic said was, ask me anything. Worst case, <laughs> you know, whatever. But but uh, I do appreciate that about you. We'll be wrapping up soon. But I want to know also, um, um, what do you – like, you were thinking of getting together with, you know, Michael and, and possibly – what about Sammy? But Michael and maybe Michael Mikey Scars. Um what makes those guys? Let's talk about Francis and Scars. You were all at Capo level, right? Yes. And and what makes a Capo different than maybe the traditional soldier? So we know it's hard to get made, right? Right. But then it's even harder to go. I think about it. There's probably only 750 made guys all in and around New York. There's probably only like 45 captains or 50 captains. Right. right? It's not. A, it's not at the channel like everybody says. Who has 20? Who has eight? Who has none? So, like, you're, like, one of 50 guys that hold that spot. What makes a captain different and their perspective different than, let's say, a soldier? Um, I think a captain has to have the understanding. Um, in my experience, I felt I had understanding. I had the sternness when I had to be stern. I wasn't afraid as far as it wasn't about just the button. It was about the individual. Yeah, and fair. fair. I felt I was always fair with people. Now, I got a management question for you before I wrap up because, again, I care about the business side. Um, I have gotten promoted amongst my team multiple times. So I'd be on a team. I get promoted. Another business on my team got promoted. I'm assuming you got promoted. At least some of these guys were in your crew, correct? Excuse like me? When you got promoted to the captain, yes. you, were, you, you resided over, your, at the very least, part of your old crew, correct? Yes, it was my entire old crew. It was actually Vinny's crew. Okay. When I was his acting captain, then yeah. he got elevated to acting boss, and I took yeah. over his crew. So, so how do you? How do you? And you probably like this question. How do you lead a guy on a rule that last week he says, Dominic, you're telling me I can't do this, but you and I did this together last week. That happens when you get promoted from your group. How right. did you handle that when you're like my boss now, and you're like Tom, you can't. You know, we're gonna lock out light clubs. And like, bro, we, we were just at four night clubs last, or whatever that is. You got what I'm saying? I like, didn't. I didn't. That was one thing I didn't listen to Vinny. Okay. Because Joe Messino's thing was you can't go to strip clubs. You yeah. can't. Do I'm like, no, 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 no. I did too many years in jail. You ain't gonna. You're not telling me. So Vinny's thing to me was just keep it under the radar. Got it. Stay under the radar, and that's that what I did. Just, but that was just an example. When you got promoted, my guess my question is, you were leading guys that you used to do dirt with, right? Right. Now you're kind of the boss. How did you transition to the boss, especially guys over? You kind of probably did shit you weren't supposed to do. Let's be honest, right? Or no? I, I didn't open up myself to that many people. When I went oh, out, okay, it, okay. it would be Anthony Aiello, Bruno, yeah. Anthony Donato, and PJ. Got really, it. those would – that was my core guys that we could go out, let our hair down, do whatever we want. All the other guys, it would be mostly business. Uh, so that's actually if you do go out, it would okay. be at a restaurant. Got it. I wouldn't let my head down with too many people. Got it. So, now, not that you're active, and I'm not suggesting it, but <laughs> just for people that are watching, um, what's the strength of the Banano family nowadays, in your opinion? Uh, the strength, I the strength is always there. I think yeah. it's the leadership that they're lacking, uh, yeah. the respect of the leadership, and that's where I think the turmoil. The person who I think will be, uh, now that the boss is locked up, who could pull things together is a second-in-command, alleged second-in-command, Johnny Joe. Um, I think he has a lot of respect out there. He's been around a long time. Uh, he's not a buffoon like Michael. Uh, Michael were, is a buffoon. Were, were Especially you on the, we did at the wake. That, that's the, disgusting. Were you on the street when his son made like 25 guys, or that was that after you? No, that was after me. That was. I don't, after know, me. They, I don't know if they kept their button. I, I, I'm interested to find out. If that they, was after me. Yeah. So, all right. So, final question. I asked this of most of my guests that I'm interested in asking this. Um, you and I have a nice cigar, nice dinner. You can invite any three people that are alive, that are in the life, 
that we would know about. Who are they and why? Who are they? Three people. Vinny Basciano. Wow, that's interesting. Okay. Big Ernie Muscarello. Interesting. And Quiet Dom. Wow. Damn. Interesting. Well, that's me three. Because they asked me now the why part. Okay, yeah, let's go to the why. <laughs> because I want to bring up what happened and let them tell Vinny you were wrong. Oh. You were wrong. You should have never said anything. How dare you? You were wrong taking everything from Dominic. You were wrong. Damn. I them because I, I know it. I, I already know it. Well, Dom told me prior to me cooperating. That's a lot to unpack. Uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate the why on that. Uh, check out Dominic's show. It's uh, Mafia Roundtable. Correct. Uh, MafiaRoundtable.com. Um, you know, you want to support him, check out egvodka.com. Dom, I had high expectations. This exceeded that. I don't think this will be the last time we're going to speak. No, Tom, I, I would really like to do things with you. I said that from the beginning, from day agreed, one. Agreed, agreed. I would agreed. definitely like us to do, formulate something that works yeah. for both of us, maybe get a few more people on board. Absolutely. Where we have a Joe Rogan type feel where yeah. it's entertaining. I love it. So comment below. I'm going to put this on Mobsters Inc., um, and I'm going to put highlights on, on uh, the new theory and also the audio people. Thanks for listening in because this was a longer one for our, our pod. And, and uh, Dominic, thank you so much for being on the show. Tom, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And it's, it was long overdue with us. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you.